Hey guys, how you going? I am VolSC, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Build Some Lists. This is the video series in which I jump onto Infinity Army 6. Hopefully you join me. We've got our glass of wine here. We're going to be drinking. We're going to be thinking about Infinity, our favorite game. And we're going to be doing one of the fun, funnest things, the funnest things ever, and that is building army lists. Almost as much fun as actually playing Infinity is going onto this app and just building lists and working out what we're going to play with. So, um, I'm going to go through three army lists in this video, as I usually do, all from different factions or sectorials, and um, you guys can come with me and uh, share with me as I come through my uh, thought process on building lists. As always, it's not going to be about coming up with the most ITS competitive list necessarily, but we may try and get there or part of the way there. Uh, the main point is to have a bit of fun and for me to share with you uh, my thoughts about the process of list building and how we might sort of build a list around a particular model or a concept or whatever that may be. Ah, excited. All right. Where are we going to start? So um, today I would like to revisit a model that came out a little while ago, and that is Wild Bill. I haven't really had enough of a chance to talk about him on the channel yet. I talked talk about him briefly, but haven't seen him in any actual games of mine recently, and I haven't thought that carefully about how to put him into army lists. And uh, for that reason, we're going to start there. We're going to make a list built around Wild Bill. Now, when I think of Wild Bill, the um, Infinity character, um, you know, in the actual game as opposed to Aristia, because I don't really know much about him in Aristia. I'm thinking of a guy who really uh, can benefit from the link team bonuses. He really shreds you because of his, um, you know, sick, uh, marksmanship level two, which is a very rare ability to have in a link team. We've got it with the Rushi now. Um, obviously, we have it with the Dakini attack bots, and we know that that kind of thing just kicks butt. Uh, Wild Bill, though, has uh, just a plain old rifle, which is still really good with um, assisted fire level two, or I should say. Uh, um, marksmanship level 2 is what I'm trying to get my, my mouth around there. Um, so that's that's really good, but he really shines at close range with his multi-pistols as well, and obviously he can be a powerhouse and ARO at the right range ban. Now, the trick is getting him into a 5-man link team, though, because not every sectorial allows him to do that. Um, you might look at, say, um, US Ariadna, um, which can count him as a grunt, but the thing about him is that I want him to be moving out in the second or third turn and pushing over to their side of the board potentially after the game has sort of simmered down a little bit and delivering a bit of a crushing blow uh, by racing across there, hitting on 19s with his rifle, assuming there's no other mods, and just um, you know blapping them or even coming up close range and taking out really important models with his uh, amazing multi-pistols with the, the massive link bonuses. Um, U.S. Ariadna, though, because of the 4-2 speed of grunts, I think you're less likely to do that big, you know, bold push out later in the game with the whole link team uprooting and running over there. Which is why our first list is going to be a Kapu Kalki list. QK from Hakaslam, and we're going to select our boy, Wild Bill, and we're going to put him in um, the list, and we're going to make him uh, part of a link team. Wild Bill, legendary gunslinger. So, um, between the rifle and contender um, profiles, I'm definitely favoring the rifle because in ARO, there are other things that can ARO in your army list, and uh, the rifle has that, that burst value, which you're really going to be relying on. So, if you are going to be going and doing some shooting, bearing in mind that if, if you're shooting at something which is between 8 to 16, the rifle's still going to be better than the multi-pistols, because you'd much rather have the plus 3 uh, to hit um, and the extra dice, right? Surely. So we take the rifle, and the, the the plan is, if we're shooting it beyond 16, maybe another member of the link team can do that. Um, if it's 8 to 16, he uses his rifle, and up close, he uses his multi-pistol. So he's going to be BS 16 in the link, ignoring cover, plus 3 for range in, in, in those scenarios we just talked about. He'll have shock, thanks to Mark's at level 2. Um, and Fatality Level 1 is going to give him a uh, damage 14 rifle. The multi-pistols, of course, are going to be forcing two saves for every hit that they uh, achieve, so if you push him into enemy territory far enough, um, he's really going to crack some skulls. Now, for this list, he's going to be counting as a Janissary, so it's really going to be a list that's kind of based around that core of Janissary, so we're going to have to have at least one Janissary in there. All right, so let's go over to Janissaries as the next logical step. 
Um, now clearly we need something that can actually fight beyond 16 inches and for that we uh, select the very obvious Janissary HMG. I, I believe that's got to be in there. Of course the missile launcher is also long range but we're talking about a situation where you're moving out, you just need to pick off a couple of flashbulb spots or war cores or whatever it may be or maybe you're shooting against an enemy um, TO sniper and you just want something that's going to be at the correct range band. Even though Wild Bill is a very good at shooting, if he's firing his rifle at, say, you know, post-human sniper, you're going to be minus three long range, minus three cover, minus six for T.O. Camo, and suddenly his chances of hitting just go right down there, whereas the Janissary may be hitting on, like, tens on five dice in that sort of circumstance, given the correct range, minus for cover, minus for six for, OD, um, for Camo ODD, plus three for the Link Team, so you get, uh, like, at least something you can work with. Five dice on tens versus one dice on a 13, for example, you can manage that. So the Janissary is in there. Now we don't need to fill out the entire fire team core with Janissaries. And if you can avoid that, it's typically good to do that because as I've said so many times on this channel, uh, building a fire team core uh, is not so much about spending as many points as you possibly can. Uh, it's about efficiency. You know, you, you get one guy to be the point man doing the shooting or the arrowing and everything else provides a supporting role in terms of cutting costs or providing specialist abilities or whatever it may be. So for that, we now turn to other um, other options. We can, I'll, and I'll come back to the Janissaries in a sec, but um, what I'm gonna do here is jump straight over to the Hafsa. Everybody who plays QK knows that the Hafsas are really amazing in the sense that they can pretend to be other members of the Link team, and that does catch a few people out. So if we grab a Hafsa Lieutenant, Hafsa Heavy Rocket Launcher, Hafsa Fort Observer, availability four, that's great. We could even have a fourth one, but we sort of need to pump the brakes, the brakes there because it says, up to two Hafsas can be part of any fire team, um, but not those of mercenary troops, which is fine because we're not running mercenaries here apart from Wild Bill. Uh, Wild Bill counts as a Janissary, so technically we've got two Janissaries in there uh, officially. So one of these Hafsas will not be allowed to be in the link team, which I'm actually okay with. This lieutenant, maybe that lieutenant should be somewhere else because that way the lieutenant's gonna hang up by himself, he's gonna to pretend to be something else which is unlikely to be a lieutenant, and our opponent wouldn't necessarily know which of our models is the lieutenant, so that gives us a, an advantage. Then we can come over to Lila Sharif, who's a wild card. So we can grab her, she can be the fifth member of the link team, just chuck her in like that. And that way we've got, um, you know, Lila sometimes providing the shock, um, you know, ammunition to the link team at that medium range bands, for example, between 16 and 24. Whereas Wild Bill, although he does have shock already because of a marksmanship level two, um, she'll be maybe better um, in terms of the range um, if it's specifically 16 to 24 we're talking about. But the other thing as well, is she's got the D charges, which can be useful, especially in, um, in countermeasures and killer hacker device, uh, certainly something that could come in handy if you encounter a assault hacker in the middle of the table that uh, tries to oblivion your, your janissary, just stuff like that. She's a good specialist, so is the half support observer, who can be your liaison officer, by the way, although that's a bit of a giveaway, I suppose, if you're having it hollow echo one as something else. So already we've got the fire team core there. And Bill is backed up. We've got the HMG for the long range. Bill's going to do all the shooting at the close range. These guys are helping to keep the overall cost of the Link team down. And um, you'll notice that I've popped the heavy rocket launcher in there as well. And I, f I find that's a really cool idea when um, you're using hollow projector level one. Because it's going to be in the Link team. And your opponent may believe you when you chuck in a Janissary that happens to be... Um, you know, with a boarding shotgun, for example, and you may have left the boarding shotgun just slightly exposed at one point. So they drop around with something like a, um, you know, a, a drop trooper, airborne deployment side of the table, and they, they try to at you with a spitfire, thinking, oh, yeah, he's got a boarding shotgun, I'm in the correct range band, he's going to be long range. And then suddenly you've got a heavy rocket launcher and a link team with two dice, and uh, you may be able to win that. So that's, that's where that can be really handy. Also, if your opponent thinks, oh, you, you know, you're moving out with your link team, but you don't have any, um, you know, template weapons, so I can be a bit careless there, then suddenly you do have a template weapon coming out of Hollow Projector 1 state. So I think that could be quite a cool little piece to that, that Hafsa heavy rocket launcher. So yeah, um, coming back to the Janissaries for a second, um, I really do like the look of the Akbar Doctor, because um, when you're defending, if you're trying to aero with your Janissary HMG, or if you took a, a missile launcher, um, and you deliberately let, you, let your guy go unconscious, 
and um, you need to revive them. That um, that act by Doctor is really, really cool then because you regain two wounds and you go from zero back to two, which is really, really strong. The only reason I don't go as far as actually taking him is that um, I don't find it acceptable to take another 40 points model there when you can just grab a 16 point Ghulam to do the Doctor work. And that 16 point Ghulam Doctor has, um, you know, Doctor Plus anyway, which is arguably more useful than Doctor um, uh, Akbar Doctor a lot of the time. So it's a shame not to go for him, but uh, there it is. Janissaries have Religious, which I think is pretty cool. Um, it, it may be a bit of a problem if you're defending with a missile launcher, for example, and you're trying to aero them and you take exactly one wound and you can't drop into cover because you're religious and you fail the test and they shoot at you again and they do two wounds to you and you're removed from the table. That's why maybe the um, you know missile launcher in this team and defending with that might not be the best. The HMG can do it, but a lot of the time you're just hanging back and not even you know aeroing in the obvious spots with this little team. So that's what the core of the army is going to look like. What about the other uh, lot of people? So um, Fanhouse Remotes, you can grab three. May as well grab them all. I also want to um, have... Do I want a Jambazan? Jambazan um, can be interesting in this list because you still have smoke thanks to the Yon ones, which we're, we are going to take some of. I think I'm actually going to leave the Jambazan at home though, because normally with um, Hakaslam, you've got the guys in was just to throw the smoke out there, then you move the Jambazan out, and that's quite a good combination. Whereas with this, uh, the smoke might not be as conveniently located nearby for the Jambazan to make use of. And when it comes to just blasting some sort of enemy sniper with your MSV2 guy, you can probably do that with a Janissary HMG anyway, because it's a heavy infantry model and a link team, it's going to like bust enough balls that you'll be able to pull that off. So let's just leave the Jamazan to one side for now. With our uh, remaining SWCs, what we could do is get um, get a Shihab remote. And I like the idea of this uh, TR bot being in there because it will uh, synergize with the EVA repeater that we might decide to take. Uh, that will then allow us to get the plus three bonus for dropping in with the Yuan Yuans. So we grab three Yuan Yuans just with the cheapest uh, shock um, close combat weapon option. They will inevitably roll up some useful stuff with booty level one, but um, now they're going to be dropping on a flat 14s because inferior combat drop jump will subtract three from the physical check. Then you're adding plus three for the, um, the Evo hacking bonus. So I find that's pretty cool. And then in your active turn, the Evo hacker can put assisted fire onto your Shihab remote for defending purposes or attacking, as the case may be. You might want to not want to commit your Janissary HMG. So we can do it that way, which is pretty cool. Um, I also am a big fan of the Alhawa Assault Hacker and Ford Observer. I think they're both really awesome. Um, so we can pop those guys in there. Um, either the Ford Observer can be the liaison officer or the Hafsa can. But with the Ford Observer being on the Alhawa, what you can do there is if that's going to be the liaison officer, then you don't have to reveal that one of your uh, mysterious Hollow One models is actually a Ford Observer. So these guys could pretend to be different kinds of Hafsas or they could pretend to be um, Janissaries, for example. Let's just quickly ch click on Janissaries. Yeah, the fire team core, they don't have a special um, type of team, so that's a shame. But um, yeah, um, your lieutenant, of course, can also pretend to be whoever he wants, really. You could, you know, pretend to be just some, like a Jambazan with a, a HMG if you wanted. Um, I think your opponent would probably suspect that it's not really uh, that guy, but whatevs. Then we've got Ghulam, um, Dr. Bluss, we're going to have to take him because um, we want to be able to revive uh, people like Wild Bill or the Janissary. I mean, Wild Bill's got NWI, but um, more importantly, the Janissary, I think, if, if that goes down, would want to revive that. Um, one thing I'm not really liking so far, actually, is the fact that we are missing an engineer. Um, engineer would be preferable if we're going to run the HMG um, TR bot. So let's just see what it would take to get one of those guys in there. There's no engineer Ghulam. I think we have to take the Najarun, who's 17 points. Uh, what, would, what would we drop for that? Um, I feel like maybe we'd have to come back and drop a couple of flash pulse spots, but I wouldn't really want to do that. Maybe one flash pulse spot and one Yuan Yuan, or maybe we don't end up taking both Al Um Yeah, it's, it's a bit tough. Anyway, the main point of this exercise is just to show you guys how I would think about approaching a QK list that had Wild Bill in it and maybe give you a bit of inspiration if you want to um, try playing a different version of QK that you normally do that uh, involves them. I don't think it's a particularly strong list, but um, one thing that does have going for it is that 
uh, at the beginning of the game, you're harassing them and trying to uh, really beat them down with the Yuan Yuan's and pick off some important key units that might pose a problem for your link team. And then later on in the game, turns two or three, you might be able to spend some command tokens, move a couple of models into group one if it needs to be refilled, and then go on a 10 order spree with your group, gunning people down with the Janissary, and then once you get into their sort of, you know, back line of the table, Wild Bill should really be able to get some, some good kills because the 6-2 speed is very useful for getting into the, the shooting spot, and then BS-13, plus 3 for range, plus 3 for the link team on 4 dice with a rifle, um, with shock, uh, damage 14, that's pretty scary. And with the multi-pistols, man, if you come around the corner and you're fighting uh, a tag, for example, um, and you're just blasting at close range with multi-pistols, that's it's probably going to go down pretty quickly. You know, 19s to hit. What is it, three, four shots, actually, because there's two multi-pistols. You can choose AP or the double action. Probably double action is, is the way to, way to go. But damn, he's scary. Um, all things considered, though, Wild Bill is a model that, um, when I field him in some lists, I'll sometimes field him just by himself or in a three-man team. Um, he's just really kind of interesting as a situational... Uh, problem solver piece uh, that you can't really rely on over a large number of games but he's appropriately uh, costed and priced for what he does in my view um, in wi on a 27 point model as long as you're you're the in the act of turn and avoiding things like mines and anything which, which has shock that may sort of get around that ability um, you're on to a, a bit of a winner so i think we could probably spend some more time on this and make this a bit better but um, i like it I'd, I'd play something like this Time now to move on to our next list. We'll have a look at it. What are we going to do next? Mm. Mm -mm. Okay. We're going to do our next list next. And I've got to say the main reason for me doing this video today is because I'm really excited about showing you um, my next list idea for Onyx. And we're probably going to spend the most time on this list because it's so goddamn fascinating and interesting. I guarantee that you, if you haven't thought of this before, this will really um, be quite an exciting list for Onyx because it's it's different, it's special, and uh, it incorporates a lot of rules that we don't normally use in Infinity. So I'm excited. Hope you guys are excited as well. Let's get into it. Onyx Contact Force. Let's click the button. So how do I explain the concept here? Let's let's talk about it. Let's have a talk. So Kurnow is a pretty obvious choice for Onyx. Nobody's going to be surprised about him. And the thing I find fascinating about Kurnow is that he's equipped with a pitcher, and he counts as a nexus for fireteam composition, which is why after your, your first you know choice of Onyx, to, of Kurnow being in the list, your secondary thing to go in the list is quite um, often the Unidron with the um, Tinbot A deflector. So you can fire your pitcher across the table, and if you're hacking something through the picture, you've got Maestro because he's got a EI killer hacking device, which is upgraded to include Maestro. They all are. And um, you've got uh, potentially the firewall bonus if it's just an ordinary hacker hacking back uh, to you. And it's a deflector as well. So let's say they've got a interventor um, with a hacking device plus. So you fire your picture across the table. It lands within eight inches of their uh, interventor. And you go into a hacking wall with them. And let's say he uses his hacking device to attack back at you. Um, he's going to be minus three because you're using Maestro, another minus three for the firewall, and another minus three for the deflector, so minus nine, which is pretty crappy. And you're going to be plus three for your Maestro. Maybe minus three for if he's got Sucker Punch or some sort of program to use, but Kurnow, the point is Kurnow has a massive advantage against just normal hackers, and even against killer hackers, he's he's got a leg up. Let's say they've got Mary Problems, and you fire that pitcher next to her, well, she can hit you with a lightning or red rum or whatever she wants to use, but you've still got the benefit of the deflector. It's still your active turn. Your hacking program is still better than hers, plus three, minus three. I can't for the life of me remember whether she has um, NWI or not, but um, you don't necessarily have to use Maestro if you don't um, particularly want to. But the point is that he's very, very good at killing other hackers. This pitcher, though, he's Blister School 12. And if we have a look at pitchers real quick, the pitcher has certain range bands, so um, importantly, 8 to 16, you've got plus 3 to hit, 16 to 24, you're minus 3 to hit, and then uh, right up to 48, you're minus 6. So 
He starts at BS12, goes to up to BS15 for being in the link. So he can land those pitches anywhere within 48 inches, and the um, the worst he'll have of it is 9s to hit on 2 dice, which is pretty reliable. If somehow he gets them within 24 inches, well, it's 12s to hit on 2 dice, which is really quite likely to get a hit. They are disposable too, but we are going to include some Ikadrons in this list to replenish his, um, his repeaters, right? So you've got Kurnow on the list, you've got the K1 combi rifle there, no, nothing surprising so far. Um, Plasma Sniper, of course, we're going to put Assisted Fire on him, he's going to be a real beast. We're going to take a Ford Observer because we want a Liaison Officer, and we're going to take a basic Pleb Plasma Carbine because we want a five-man link team. Okay? So this is the kind of setup that I take all the time when I play Onyx. But here is where the list suddenly gets really interesting. Umbra Samaritan, we are going to take the EI Assault hacking device. Uh -huh. Very rarely would I take that profile. So this guy is very vulnerable against um, enemy killer hackers and needs to close the distance to get his assault hacking device to work and there's a lot of stuff that he won't be able to influence with his assault hacking device, but we're going to take him anyway. Next, we're going to take a Rodok. Again, this is a model that I don't uh, profile that I don't normally take. I don't really like the Rodok as a unit, but for this list, we're going to take a Rodok assault hacker. Huh, huh, huh. And then the next model we're going to take. Let's have a look. What else can we take? Oh, oh, oh! Can I come back to the Rodok? Another assault hacker. Hmm. Oh, things getting interesting. We've already got three assault hackers in there. Next, what are we going to take? <clears throat> Where is it? Where is it? Eh. Where is it? Here it is. An e-drone. I think you guys are starting to get the gist of it. We've got a lot of hackers in there. And already we can see that um, this list uh, can do some really interesting hacking shenanigans. Um, we haven't finished group one yet. I'm just going to go quickly grab a basic uh, Nexus Lieutenant Specialist because we need a lieutenant in the list. And um, let's talk about it. So here's how, the, here's how the strategy works. You try and take first turn, and once you've deployed your army list, you, you use Kurnow as the reserve trooper, almost always. Then when your opponent deploys, you put Kurnow somewhere near the link team so he can link up with them, but you're planning on getting the, the right angle so that he can move out slightly as part of the link in the first order, and fire his pitches across the table near to something that's important to them, like their lieutenant or a tag or a killer hacker or um, a, a support hacker or whatever it may be, and he'll land the pitches. If it's a long way away, it's two dice on nines or less, and if he fails, well, in the second group, we've got some Ikadrons. We're going to put at least one nearby to him. The Ikadron can spend a single order moving over to him and moving back, and that will automatically replenish him at the cost of one order from group two, importantly. We're not using the precious group one orders. So the chances of him getting a pitcher down during that turn are very, very, very high, unless, of course, um, some sort of sniper comes out of nowhere and shoots him, which is why you've got to be careful when you're lining up the angle from, say, behind a wall, past the wall, over to a, a point nearby to their t the target you're trying to get, and hopefully not sort of coming into line of sight of any sniper towers or, or likely spots where they may launch a missile or shoot at you with a sniper. So once you've got the pitcher down, and mind you, it'll be ex incredibly easy if it's um, if it's not that far away. Like if you if you have the ability to put it down 24 inches away or less, and still have the further eight inch range from the repeater network, um, you know, zone of control, then it's extremely likely you'll get that off. But you've now landed a pitcher, a repeater, nearby to your target. Let's say it's an enemy um, interventor. Uh, hacking device plus. Well, then you just keep hacking it until it dies with Kurnow, with Maestro, whatever you've got. If you lose, well, um, probably we're going to have a medtech um, Obsidian journalist nearby to him to revive him, okay? So that's going to rough him up. What if, though, they've got a tag? What if they've got um, something like an avatar, a Marut, or um, whatever it may be? Well, here's, here's the beauty of this. The e-drone, um, the Evo repeater, gives you the ability to make um, coordinated order attacks with friendly hackers, and they don't all have to choose the same program. 
So by spending one command token and a regular order from group one, you can actually attack that tag with your Umbra and your two Rodox and roll three dice to try and possess it. And then you possess it and it's already on their side of the table next to their troopers and you turn around and start shooting them. Or you spend the rest of the turn moving that tag towards your line and just place it base to base contact with this guy, the Umbra Samaritan. Then in their turn, they spend a command token to revive it or to pull it back but they can't leave uh, base contact with your Samaritan because they'd be engaged at that point. And does your tag really want to attack something with CC24 and a Vorpal close combat weapon? Well, probably not. Um, also, if you've brought their tag over to your side of the table, every time it activates, you can attempt to possess it again with three hackers. So imagine that as your opening turn. Kurnow fires the pitcher, everybody coordinates onto that tag, possesses it, and you've got the tag for the rest of the game, basically. Imagine that. Or if you hit it with a um, Oblivion, like let's say they're playing an Avatar and you manage to go first and you just uh, isolate their Avatar turn one. Yuck. Incredibly bad. Here's the other thing though. What if they don't have something that's hackable? What, what if that's the case? Um, well, this is also good against a lot of Sectorials. What if you're up against, say, a, um, a Varuna player and they've got a Kamal Sniper in a five-man link team, as most people usually do, and that's... I mean, it's not that comfortable going after that with the Plasma Sniper because it's three dice versus two, and he's shooting on 16s, and you're shooting on something like 14s, and it's not that comfortable. However, the E-Drone has this wonderful uh, hacking program called Exile, which means that you can target a, a, a model of a link team, even if it's not normally hackable. And if you do beat it in that uh, little face-to-face -face roll, it's not only um, broken out of the link team, the link team's not only removed, but it's isolated as well. So imagine that, you plant the repeater next to the, the Varuna Sniper, the E-Drone has a few attempts at exiling it, does succeed, uh, and then you attack it with the Plasma Sniper. And hilariously, even though Sixth Sense Level 2 is enough to um, evade and get around white noise, it will counter white noise, after it's been isolated, it won't be in the link team anymore. It won't actually have Sixth Sense Level 2, so Kurnow could use the repeater that's next to it and put the white noise down, and then you shoot it with a Plasma Sniper. And hey, look, I mean, there's a lot of orders, but if the only thing you achieve that turn is to kill their Sniper, like completely remove it off the table, then the rest of that game is, is, is going to be a lot easier. It's kind of worth it to do that. Here's the next thing, which I think is kind of funny. Group 2 hasn't even been completed yet. What if we go to Group 2 and we add, wait for it, a T-Drone. A T-Drone. And of course, um, because we've got another 8 points, we can pop in a couple of um, Imitrons as well. Now, if you're thinking what I'm thinking, you'll be thinking, hang on a second, don't my Assault Hackers have access to a program called Spotlight? And doesn't Spotlight just work? You don't, it doesn't even face against BTS. You'd be thinking correctly, and normally people don't like Spotlight because it's minus three to hit. It's very order inefficient. But what if you had three dice? Yeah? What if you plant that pitcher next to them, and you do a um, coordinated hack onto the target, and you're using the Umbra Samaritan and both Rodok hackers, and although they're minus three to hit, it's 11 for the, Sam the, the Samaritan and 10s for the Rodox. Does that increase your odds of getting a spotlight off onto their lieutenant or to their Varuna sniper or their tag or whatever it might be? Of course it does. And is it worth doing that with most of Group 1's orders? I would think so because um, you may spend a couple of orders getting Kurnow's pitcher onto the ground. And then you may spend a few more orders and command tokens getting the spotlight done. But then you've got the entire Group 2 um, here to just rain missiles on them with a the T-Drone. Missiles will be on one dice, but you get plus six. So hitting on an 18, and they're probably dodging uh, at a minus three because they can't see you. I think that's how it works. So imagine a missile raining down on the head of William Wallace, for example, because you threw the pitcher next to him. He's normally not hackable, but you put the spotlight on him. He's targeted. Then the missiles are raining down on him, kills him, and uh, the Caledonia player is starting their turn with a whole bunch of stuff that's irregular, after all, and lost lieutenant. Um, and then in your follow-up turn, you just start attacking them again, start picking off whatever you want, McMurrah or whatever they may have with your T-Drone the second time. It's time-consuming, and it's very order-intensive, and you may not get a lot done, but in the late game, it's going to be a lot easier to push out with Kurnow and your Plasma uh, team and just um, finish, finish people off and set up AROs that they can't really deal with. Imagine that. Well, let's say it's just their Grey Rifle that you've got the best access to. 
um, you can put exile on them and spot it light them at the same time. So the pitcher goes down next to the gray rifle and the five man link team. Caledonian guy has no idea what's going on. You spend the command token and all four of them attack. The Samaritan, Rodok, Rodok, and E-Drone because you're allowed to use different hacking programs. So three of them are using spotlights and one of them is using an exile. And after all that, you'll eventually deal with that gray rifle. After that gray rifle has been dealt with, do they have anything in their army that can attack against a plasma sniper that's got assisted fire and a five-man link? They may not. They were relying on that one thing to be able to do that. So you can sort of see how this list has some potential. Now, I um, came up with this list as I was thinking about ways that you can punish somebody for always playing Joan of Arc. And I always play against Joan of Arc when I play Pano these days. Imagine if it's Joan of Arc. So the pitcher goes down next to her. You can split it up so one guy's isolating her with oblivion, another guy is um, spotlighting her, and another guy is just, you know, carbonating her or whatever just to make it easier for the, the T drone later. Imagine if Joan dies in the first turn because of that. All of this stuff that's irregular is going to stay irregular that game. Joan's a massively important piece in terms of, you know, points. She's a good fighter in the late game, and she provides that inspiring leadership buff. That's not going to be there anymore. That's absolutely crushing. So if you guys are excited about this list, um, so am I. Um, we've got to be realistic and talk about some of the scenarios where this list is actually not a good list. Like, if you're going into a tournament, you definitely want to play a normal Onyx list alongside this that you can fall back on a lot of the time, right? This is going to, only going to be useful in some of the situations we've just been talking about. So if your opponent takes first turn, for example, and moves like a zero killer hacker over near to the Rodox and starts picking them off and then retreats and does stuff like that, or if your opponent's the one who's got, say, um, like a Squallow who's lobbing heavy grenades down on top of your Unidrons, that's going to be terrible. If your opponent's running a vanilla list, which has a lot of marker state and things that, you know, you can't really get to with your hackers, that's just going to suck. Uh, vanilla, uh, vanilla Ariadna, um, armies that don't really care about losing lieutenants, just stuff like that. You're not going to want, want to run this list all of the time. This is for some special, you know, opponents. But you can sort of see how there are some tough enemies that would actually be really humiliated by this list as well. The Joan of Arc lists could potentially get crushed. What about that Tunguska Holloman castle, which a lot of people struggle against? You fire the pitcher next to the Holloman with the missile launcher. You isolate him, you spotlight him, you exile him, you rain down missiles on him. He's just a corpse. Your opponent's thinking, ha ha, I'm going to engineer him and uh, take him out of isolation state and revive him. But then you go, ha ha, and pull out your um, Good Knight, which is an ability I've never used before in Infinity, ever. But Good Knight is apparently a hacking program, which uh, is an upgrade on the Samaritan and the E-Drone. And either of them can just use that repeater to, um, to remove him, because it works on any model that has... Um, uh, that is unconscious and has the remote presence rule, uh, as far as I know. So it's a, it's a way of removing a corpse, whereas normally hacking doesn't do damage to non-hackers. In that case, you eliminate the missile launcher, render him unconscious, then remove him with good night. And the game's suddenly a lot easier, because that was the one thing that that, that list is sort of relying on. And uh, after that, you can start doing the same thing to the other models, or if they've got a hacker, that's going to be something that you can take on as well. And after that, the only thing they may have left is really a few Spectres, uh, maybe a, a Spectre Sniper, but... Um, think about that as if you've got the active turn, you can usually deal with it if you've got a plasma sniper because if they win, you can revive them and you keep firing at them with assisted fire and that's really going to work. So such a fascinating list. I don't know if, the, if I really have the balls to take this to a tournament yet, but um, I'm be keen to practice it someday, maybe even on TTS and see what I can do with it because I, I put a lot of thinking into this and I'm quite excited by how it makes the T-Drone suddenly a lot more viable. Um, and, of course, the Assault Hackers. You may be saying, well, their hacker can do U-turn, and, you know, the, the Smart Missile is kind of hackable as well. But I don't know if you realize, um, if they've got a hacker, we can go after that first. Don't forget that Maestro renders something unconscious. It doesn't remove it from the table. So let's say they've got a five-man link team with a, a regular Assault Hacker in it like Valeria Gromos and Deschart, for example. You fire the pitcher, you render her unconscious with Maestro first, then you could spotlight her corpse, then you can fire the T-Drone on it, and if they've got anything near, if they accidentally put uh, Valeria Gromos next to their Zuyong HMG or Rushi, well, guess what? Uh, the missile's landing on the corpse and everything else is having to dodge, right? So 
Um, I wouldn't be wor too worried about U-Turn. I mean, it's it's good if they have hackers in their list. Imagine a regular Yu Ching list with a Dao Ying lieutenant. Um, you know <laughs> that guy's going to be really afraid to reveal him. I mean, if he does a U turn uh, to go against your missile, then he's going to lose his lieutenant because you fire some more pitches out there and uh, hit him with a maestro. So it's fun. Oh, I just can't stop thinking about this list. I was really excited when I first came up with it, but we are going to have to move on. I really hope you guys dig this and let me know what you think. Ah oh, man, info war, info war. Hmm. Alrighty, lucky last. The third list we're going to talk about today, and let's build some lists, is Foreign Company. And um, Foreign Company aren't known as a very good faction. I did a uh, review of the faction recently, go check that out. I also have played uh, a game of Foreign Company um, on Tabletop Simulator. But I've been thinking more and more and more about how to sort of just try and squeeze that last bit of efficiency out of um, what's not a very exciting lineup. And today we're going to have another go at it, because I'm quite keen to play some Foreign Company. The new models that are coming out with um, Hannibal and the, the A-Team are looking pretty cool. And um, although I sold my Pano a while back, I'm kind of keen to go back to some of the old Pano models as well, like the um, the Crocman. And Valkyrie, who can be mad at that? A limited edition Valkyrie with a pistol. I don't like the new shotgun version, the arm there, but um, I will be running the Valkyrie. Anyway, um, so... If we're really serious about playing, about playing Foreign Company, I think we've got to have some Securitates in there to begin with, right? So let's just have a talk about Securitates. HMG, because if you're going to take a five-man link team and if you're forking out a few extra points for Ballistic Skill 12, I really think that's the right way to go, especially since this list isn't really going to have any other reliable HMGs in it. I'm also going to grab the Multi-Sniper, uh, because this list is going to have um, three Securitates and three CSUs, and the thinking here is that if one person dies, the fifth can come in, the sixth can come in uh, to, to refill the link team. So for that reason, I don't mind putting the multi-sniper on air or duty some of the time, uh, because if you lose him and can't revive him for some reason, and by the way, we'll, we'll definitely have a Dactari, but if we can't revive him for some reason, we can still form a five-man link team thanks to the CSUs and stuff in there. So... This core is usually the way to start with Foreign Company. The Securitates are very useful because the Lieutenant's Willpower 14 doesn't cost any SWCs. They've got Veteran Level 1, which is really important because um, with Jammers being prevalent in scenarios where there's a specific thing to go over and grab, um, that solves your Jammer problems. And um, as they're moving out late game to do shooting with, uh, that BS-12 really kind of important. The CSUs are in there because they are a really cost-efficient profile, they're super cheap, the Rifle Light Shotgun Nanopulsa is a very useful combination, very good for defending your defensive link team position from um, you know closer attacks once they come in range of the Nanopulses, and it's just really useful to be able to roll those metachemistries up for three guys, because sometimes you'll have that one point man with NWI or, or something like that. Just to refresh my memory about what actually is included here, so what would what would we want um, in our group? So climbing plus, for example, or super jump, you've got a five-man link team, and one of them is able to do that as you're moving across the table. Really handy because you know um, five-man link team rifles is fine. Um, NWI again, great point man for that. Enhanced mobility, yeah, you can come along with a link team and then run off on his own very quickly. Um, so those are actually kind of useful. Uh, immunity, immunity total as well, um, that could be amazing in a link team because that's your point man to go after their flash pulse uh, bots and war cores and, and stuff like that. So that's where we start from. So what is it about this faction that uh, is going to be going across and actually doing the damage? And I can't really find it. I still can't bring myself to take a peacemaker, again, because I like going second a lot of the time. And it's a terrible model to take if you're going second. It's just, it's very clunky. You can't find the right spot for it, and it doesn't really do well long range. And um, even if you do go first, um, deploying out in the middle of the table is really not that different from deploying on your side of the table uh, and spending an extra order to walk up there. You're still going to run into snipers and hackers and uh, jammers and things like that as you get closer and closer and closer. And the Spitfire, even with assisted fire, is still going to lose some of the time um, against enemies that have mods like TO snipers and that kind of thing. So I don't really want to rely on the, the Peacemaker. Um, I'm going to make a slightly unusual choice given the lack of other options in Foreign Company. And I'm just going to go straight for the, the uh, Crocman uh, multi-sniper. And the thinking with this guy is that 
he can, in a lot of uh, maps and tables, deploy on a sniper tower that's further out there, or just deploy on a flank and be a reserve trooper, and just weasel his way in across to their side of the table and use some of those long diagonal flanking um, fire lanes where they feel like, oh yeah, my opponent's going to have to go all the way over to my side of the board before he can see past that cover, so um, I'm kind of safe. But the croc man takes that away because he's already up there. He can advance a couple of moves ahead without being shot because he's got marker state. And then he can set up in a position where it's his two dice on 15s versus your dodge. Or if you're shooting back, you're up against cover, long range, TO camo, that kind of thing. And he can get a surprising amount of work done. He is 30, 38 points, which I hate. I think it's really expensive and you, you find yourself jealous of the, the, um, the post-human sniper. But at least he's got mines as well, right? And uh, multi-terrain. So if he does get caught out, and eventually they're going to corner him with, like, Gaza Matiwas or whatever they're going to sort of catch up with him with. As he's going down, you can plant that anti-personnel mine and just take something else with him. Or at the end of your turn, set up a couple of mines and go into Mark Estate and force them to come to you, which I think is really, really cool. So we're going to try that. Um, obviously only one of them, because it's availability one. The other thing that I really want in this army list is the Bakunin Uberfall Commando. Um... And this is something which is quite, quite rare. Only nomads and a foreign company can really take. Um, and this is another thing which gives you uh, a way of going over to their side of the table and attacking and doing some damage. Even though this is a faction that doesn't really have impersonators and, um, you know, bulleteers and really powerful drop troopers. I don't really like the Akali. Uh, doesn't have sort of inferior infiltration, that kind of stuff. No Yuan Yuan. So this guy is going to be able to move out and block some fire lanes if they've got, say, a Varuna Sniper and try to get over there and get into close combat. And uh, its chances of doing that are a lot better these days because you don't have to worry about flash pulses because of total immunity. Um, it's very good at landing the Eclipse Grenades. And with Climbing Plus, it's not that difficult to get into combat with something. You're not going to do very well if you have to just trade with Shaolin Monks and Quangxi and stuff like that, but against a, a faction like Varuna maybe, you can get some Eclipse Grenades down and then climb up a wall in close combat with their uh, Varuna Sniper, and suddenly you're in a bit of an advantage there because you've got a, a Crocman Teo Sniper, and all I've got is you know just the rest of their army minus the, um, the, the Kamau Sniper and a Link Team. So that's where these guys can be very handy. Of course, they're great at jumping on things that end up on your side of the table. So if your opponent's just finished a big run and they've run out of orders on their attacking piece, this Chimera is going to be able to bash them up pretty powerfully in close combat because NWI, I call one, and the three extra pup Putniks which are swarming in on them is just really going to murder them. So that's why I think this is a very useful piece. I'm also going to take Valkyrie. Um, partly because I really like the model, but um, the other reason is that she can actually be kind of useful in the midfield and sometimes even an attacking piece to go on a run with and, and eliminate something. NWI and uh, Total Immunity makes her very, very res resilient and you might be able to have a turn where she moves out of cover, gets shot at by everything, moves again and survives and then after your next move with your new order spent, you make it into close combat with something. So you may die, but if you're berserking with uh, NWI, uh, sorry, berserking with NBW, Natural Born Warrior, uh, suddenly you're hitting with a Fizz 14 explosive close combat weapon, and that can be enough to finish off um, a really resilient target. It can be a way of killing a lieutenant or finishing off a tag, destroying uh, an objective like the one eluding and sabotaging. So that, that's really, really cool. In the late game, with her multi-rifle, um, she can go into suppression fire like in turn three and stave off uh, some enemy attacks because, again, um, uh, total immunity, uh, NWI, armor three, that can make her quite resilient. She's at least got bliss skill 12, so that multi-rifle could be really handy. And the other thing, and this is the other thing that the Pupniks can't really do, but she can do, is with the regular grenades, where if she's walked across the board a little bit and then she's doing spec fire, uh, uh, physical 14 makes that quite cost efficient, really, because she's hitting on 11. Every, every time she gets a head off, it may be two or three models taking saves or results. So I think that she's worth it. Now, moving on, we're going to round this list out. So, zeros. I would probably recommend the Ford Observer, so that we've got a liaison officer, and he's really cheap as well. And the Multi-Sniper, because, again, um, I really like uh, using the Multi-Snipers in this faction, 
because we don't have too much of anything else to spend uh, a good lot of SWCs on that I really want to use. I don't want to use Bolts, I don't want to use Orc Troopers, and I don't want to use the Akali. I just find them a little bit too lacklustre, so I'm going to go with the Zero. The thinking is that, again, if you're able to eliminate the things which can deal with your camo snipers by using Valkyrie or the Bakunins or uh, whatever it may be, um, these guys will be really, really handy. Also, if you're going first and you just can't cross the board to get grips to them, the infiltration and the surprise element of, of the snipers may uh, make all the difference. This guy, unfortunately, only has Bliss skill 11, um, but he's also very, very cheap. Just 26 points for this. I talked about a de deployable repeater guy a moment ago when I meant Ford Observer, but I actually didn't want to take either of them. Now that I remember, I kind of want the Assault Hacker in there. I love the Assault Hacker uh, because without the Assault Hacking ability um, these days, you're going to run into trouble against all of those um, tactical winners tags that people are now taking. Um, bulleteers coming across your side of the table. People expect the Assault Hacker less. They're not going to know which of your two camo markers on either side of the table is the Assault Hacker, or if you even have one. Um, and he's a really good specialist out in the midfield. Um, you guys might not like that. You might want to swap it out for a Killer Hacker, but uh, when I play Foreign Company, I'm going to take this guy um, a significant amount of the time, just due to the way the meta is changing a little bit and that tags are becoming a bit more interesting to people. Right, so we're going to need uh, some cheerleaders, so one Fugazi, Flash Pulse Bot should be okay. We've already taken our Dactari, that's really, really useful. We've maxed out on CSUs. What else do we need? Um, this, funnily enough, is a faction that can take two Warcores if you really want, so that might not be a bad idea. Um, no Orcs. We might get away with, oh yeah, so we want a Minesweeper because we want as many cheerleaders as possible. That gives us 12 points left. And did we want to take a, a Pathfinder Drone Bot? Um, yeah, Pathfinder could be pretty neat because that can be your liaison officer. And uh, Sensor, again, is a, a really useful ability. Which leaves us an awkward number of points, six. But think about the six points left as we can take two Zon Bots and we've suddenly got 300 points now. And uh, with the Zon Bots and the Dactari, I might move the Dactari into group two, actually. So bring them down here and we'll move the... Um, what are we going to put in group one? Perhaps just the mule bot. So group group one is already going to be really order hungry because of, of Valkyrie and the um, and the the these guys, or even the croc man wanting to use the orders. Group two can take uh, is mostly going to be sunk into the zeros or the pathfinder to go and press a button. But the Dactari with two Zon bots just to round this out, I like that because you can put the, the Dactari somewhere really safe. And then you can put one Zonbot next to the team with their heavy weapons there. The other Zonbot nearby to where the zero multi-sniper is going to be, if it's close to your deployment zone. Or, or if the, um, the Croc Man is close to your deployment zone as well, we can put, put that there as well uh, to support it. So, uh, six, six, S, <laughs> SWC is a six. 300 points, that's perfect. And um, we've got a list now that has some ability to take the fight to our opponents and attack if we need to do some damage game one, a turn one, sorry, in the hiding. So we can run across there with the, um, the Chimeras. Or if it's a bit more of an open table and we've got angles, the Croc Man is the reserve trooper and it spends a couple of orders moving across the side of the table and then starts picking things off. And you'd be surprised at the number of things you can pick off with a model like that. And then maybe lays a couple of mines near to their deployment zone um, in range of some guys that are going to impetuous by the end of it. Group 2, you can do something similar with your uh, multi-sniper or just go out and grab some objectives with your, your Pathfinder or do some sensor sweeps. And I, th I think that's fine, to be honest. And then if you're defending, um, your Assault Hacker is going to catch them out sometimes. Your triple sniper setup um, may be too strong for some opponents, especially if you're using a lot of stun rounds to delay them until turn 2. I, I find that could be quite neat also. Um, so defensively you're okay, and if they're really getting right up in your grill, your CSUs with nanopulses that can fire twice might be uh, a saving grace there. Double Warcore as well, it can be really quite defendy. And then in the later stages of the game, you've got that opportunity to move out with the entire Link team, including the Securitates, or making a big run with Valkyrie, 10 orders behind her could be kind of fun. Um, and you've got plenty of specialists. You've also got uh, veterans, so jammer immunity. I kind of like it. I'm starting to feel like this is a kind of list that I could actually compete with and wouldn't really be um, too much of a handicap being at the, the top of the, the bottom of the rankings in terms of power level. So this would be one of my lists, and I think I might try out the A-team with Hannibal and crew in the secondary list, but 
um, as you guys can see you know you've got a very limited number of options it's not a particularly good sectorial but after a lot of thinking and planning and theory we can start sort of twisting things so that the list starts looking better and better and better and we can ch choose some fun options in there like Valkyrie and still have something which can pack a punch and hopefully be competitive I think we'll end it there. I really appreciate you guys joining me as usual for another episode of Let's Build Some Lists. Um, yeah, feel free to give these lists a go, especially that um, Infowar Onyx list, I think is a really cool idea. It's gimmicky, it's not going to work all the time, but if you are smart, uh, it's a list that rewards skill and it rewards understanding the game if you, if you know what you're doing. It's really going to surprise a lot of opponents and really humiliate some people who thought that they were going to have a bit of fun with their tag or Joan of Arc or a link team or whatever it may be. So knock yourself out, guys. Hope you learned something, and we'll see you in the next one.